Hello, everyone, and welcome to a Channel 781 candidate interview. This is the first of what we hope will be several interviews with candidates for this year's Waltham Municipal Election. And it's a good person to start off with because it's someone whose work we've talked about quite a bit on our debrief show. I am here with Colleen Bradley MacArthur. Hi there. Hi, thank you for being here, Colleen. So Colleen is serving her first term as a city councilor at large in Waltham, and she is running for re-election. That means she'll be on the ballot on September 12th in the preliminary election where we will narrow down the candidates for at large. I want to start off with kind of a tough question. I, I think it's tough. We'll see. <laughs> So in the last election in 2021, you pulled off something pretty impressive. You were elected and you beat out a very established candidate who is actually the president of the council. The other side of that is there were seven candidates and you came in six, and now there are 13 candidates. So are you confident you can win this and why? Yes, I am confident that I can win. And I, I was truly surprised surprised uh, that I won. But then as it started to sink in, and as this first term is coming, you know, to an end, I'm realizing that as I go out and campaign, people are saying thank you to me. They're saying thank you for listening. Thank you for being present in the community. And I think those are two things that are somewhat tried and true formulas, right? And what we expect from uh, at sort of a bare minimum of our um, city leaders and our, our leaders is to be listening and be present in the community. We may not always agree with every decision they make, but we know that they're listening and we know that they're there. I have been following the different issues you've dealt with in the council. And uh, so, but if we were to kind of narrow this down and make this easy for someone who's who's just now, you know, getting involved in Waltham politics and deciding who to vote for, could you give me your top three issues or your top three priorities uh, for Waltham? And I will hold you to three. Yes, absolutely. I would say number one is planning. We held a bunch of listening sessions in the fall and I attended all of them and I was so excited about the engagement. So planning is number one. I think we need to follow up on those meetings. I think we need to lean into experts on city planning to decide. And, you know, planning sort of dovetails into my number two, which is housing. We have so many tools in our toolbox to stop what is happening right now, which is this sort of rapid development of, you know, these teardowns and rebuilds. It's not that we don't need to build housing. We just need a plan for how we're going to do it. And I think planning also ties into traffic and transportation. So every call that I get, I got calls yesterday about the work that's happening on Lexington Street. And I immediately call you know, our traffic commissioner, our leader in the traffic department, Michael Garvin, and we have great conversations about what are some potential solutions. And one of them is leaning on public transportation. So developing a North Waltham route and trying it out. I met when I was campaigning some neighbors who live right across the street from one of the bus stops on Lake Street. And they said to me, we love it here. We walk out our door and there's a bus stop on Lake Street. And I said, you're the people I've been talking about. I say people in North Waltham want public transportation. And I feel like people look at me with, you know, a strange look, like, doesn't everybody depend on cars in North Waltham? And the answer is no. So it sounds like planning is a big one because that ties into the other two. For people who may not know what's sort of the norm for planning in Waltham, what, how, does, how does the city sort of do planning now? And, and what would you do differently if it were up to you? So we don't have a planning department, and I was told that by uh, folks that I met with uh, last year to understand a little more about how our city government works and who were some of the players and uh, what their responsibilities were within the city. And I was told that um, we don't have a planning department here. And I think that that, that is, in a city of almost 70,000 people, a real deficit because everything comes from that, right? How we 
how we decide to build, where we decide to build, what the needs are, you know, and I come from the private sector, obviously, and, you know, you do a needs assessment, you try to identify where are the pain points, where are uh, people or projects struggling, and you have to have people who are experienced, they have, you know, degrees in this, and we have an RFP out for um, a planner, and I don't know, I hope um, we can get an update in August, we have a meeting next week and I'm hoping we can get an update because we need to take all the input that was given to us last year and give it to folks that know what they're doing, can assess this information. And we also need to be pressuring the MBTA to provide more bus transportation and improvements to our commuter rail. So you've had about a year and a half in office so far. What would you say are your biggest accomplishments or the things the things you're most proud of? I think the the number one thing is how we handled the ultimate lease of 240 Beaver Street. We signed for that property at the beginning of my my term and then things sort of went in a direction where it was sort of like communication broke down and transparency broke down. And so I'm really proud of the fact that I did my homework. I asked the questions. We held a forum, a listening session so that we could hear from the people. I mean, there's many projects in the city and Fernald is one of them. uh, And the farm uh, and the property at 240 Beaver Street was another where we solicited input (laughs) from the city and from folks in the city And then we did nothing with that. And to me, I think that that is somewhat of a failure of leadership when you solicit feedback and comments from your constituents, and then you either do the opposite, (laughs) ignore that, or, you know, don't, I, I guess, get in depth with that. And so that listening session, I'm really proud of that listening session because it was a, a moment where uh, a lot of transparency uh, happened. I felt like I asked the questions that needed to be asked and that was very satisfying. Now, so you're talking about the listening session that you organized with Councillor Paz and Councillor Darcy, right? And that was outside of the process that the council was following at that point. What's the value of that? Because not all councillors do that. I've noticed (laughs) in my first term that Things can move really fast if you want them to, um, or things can take a very, very long time. I think what that listening session accomplished was slowing everything down to say, let's try to understand what's really going on here, because it was very clear there was an agenda to speed things up, confuse, not be clear, not take into account everybody's opinions. And I felt like that was the right thing to do was to to bring people together, listen, and really do our homework too. We invited everybody. Um, there were several counselors that did attend uh, the listening session. No one was, you know, turned away at the door or um, and and then, you know, I I bring this up about sort of anything, you know, like the, the pride resolution, you know, I said at the end, I said, I welcome anybody else to sign on to this resolution. Any of these things, any other counselor can do, right? <laughs> so like, you know, the fact that I took the initiative and reached out to people, organized the space, brought everybody in, facilitated a, a, a listening session and a, you know, an educational programming session Anybody could have done that. So you've touched on this a little already, but what were the disappointments or the roadblocks? What were the things that, uh, the efforts that that didn't go the way you had hoped uh, during this, this term? Yeah, so this is happening right now on the doors where I've had one or two conversations with people that didn't necessarily agree with something I proposed, a resolution I proposed. I am not afraid to have that conversation. And I tell them that, like, uh, for example, the the tenants' rights resolu- uh, ordinance, excuse me, people saying that um, it's giving free rent to people. And I say, you know, that's not the intent. Um, that's not why I signed on to this uh, piece of legislation. So 
I'm gonna, you know, tell you what I think it's about and what the spirit of it is. And, and we don't have to agree, but we can have a dialogue. <laughs> and that's actually been the most disappointing thing since I have joined the council is there is no mechanism to do that effectively. And so, you know, you have to state your points when you are bringing in a resolution or speaking on a resolution or speaking on a topic, you know, and hope that they're well thought out and taking into consideration what constituents are thinking as a whole. But I just wish that there was some way, you know, um, and I'm thinking particularly of the municipal stretch code resolution that I brought in. I was really hoping for a dialogue about the essence of that, which is democratizing our sort of green initiatives. And that just got lost because it got thrown out without any kind of, you know, back and forth, which is a dialogue, right? Like two people, a couple people talking. And so that was, that was a real bummer because I feel as though we could have had a better conversation about that. And, and the same with a lot of the stuff that was sort of thrown out in the spring by the master planning committee, you know, I mean, you, you form this master planning committee and you tell people, honestly, we want to have a dialogue with our residents and our citizens and you do that and then you just meet again in the spring only to cut out a bunch of resolutions without having the dialogue or analyzing the data. I think that's been pretty disappointing. Yeah, I think, and, and this might be surprising to someone who doesn't watch the meetings often, because you have these very long meetings and things get discussed multiple times. So people might think, well, what does that mean? There's no opportunity to debate it. That that doesn't make sense. But but it's the same thing I've observed watching them is that it's rare to see a debate about the merits of something. Instead, it's like someone comes up with an agenda, someone tries to block that agenda, and then there's a debate about the rules and whether they're going about blocking it the right way or the wrong way. Is that just part of the system we have? Is that part of, you know, is that the function of, of different laws that restrict what you can say in a meeting? Or is that something that we could change? And how would you change it if you could? Yeah, I think it's probably a function of, yeah, how the system's set up. So, you know, could we look at some of the the rules, you know, and see sort of uh, if there's something that brings in a more modern element to allow for dialogue? But I also think it comes from a leadership level and um, using the rules in a neutral way, right? So when you lose control of, a sort of meeting or debate, then things get pretty sloppy pretty quickly and pretty ugly pretty quickly. And so it either makes people not want to speak or not want to have that dialogue because they're going to shy away from that, or it just shuts it down entirely. And that has happened, especially with the tenants' rights resolution in particular. I mean, there was just some mental gymnastics and, and rule and wording gymnastics that just didn't need to happen, right? And it really soured, I think, the intention of the discussion, which was, hey, maybe this, you know, the previous resolution or ordinance, the way it was written, it had served its time, right? We had done the back and forth with the committee and it was in a committee and we'd had that discussion there and it was time to throw it out and start again, which is what we did. And I think that there was probably a less painful way to talk about that um, that night than just sort of doing this gymnastics of, of the rules. And again, trying to confuse people that, like you said, not everybody watches all these meetings. And so if they see that, they're going to be turned off by that and they're not going to want to watch because nobody likes to feel stupid, right? Nobody likes to feel, they like to feel like they can follow along and that, you know, um, people are being straight with them and, and, and um, not, uh, you know, trying to trick them or not being totally, I don't know, fair or, or letting the conversation happen, right? Um, just sort of shutting it down, like you said, of, you know, taking the rules and, and using them in a, 
um, unnecessarily sort of punitive way or unnecessarily confusing way that just it just doesn't need to happen that way. Thank you. Just to follow up a little on the tenant notification ordinance, what's your understanding of where that is now? The, the council hasn't voted on it, right? Or do you think you'll vote on it this summer or in the fall? Do you have any idea on that? So right now, I believe it's tabled in uh, ordinance and rules and the conversation seemed to stem from analyzing, I think, the um, feedback that we had from that community input session. And I think there is a lot to digest there and, and rightfully so, right? This is a heated issue uh, for a number of reasons. We are in a housing crisis. And what does that mean for one group of people versus another group of people? And uh, I've heard it uh, when I've been out and I've been listening to both sides, all sides. There's not even both sides. There's all sides. There's folks that, um, you know, have sort of a third way that they feel about <laughs> this ordinance. And I think it it warrants uh, an analysis of what we heard. But I also, um, I want to, you know, the people that I've talked to that are not in favor of it, or maybe there are parts of that ordinance that make them uncomfortable. I want to keep having a dialogue about that because I've talked to a few people like that where they kind of understand both sides, but they're really thinking, no, this isn't right for Waltham. And I want to almost kind of like poke at that a little bit and try to understand that a little bit better. Like, I I don't always agree that we're unique <laughs> and special. I mean, we are, but we're not in a lot of ways. We face a lot of the same problems that Metro, you know, suburbs, um, you know, face. And so can we be looking towards how it's worked for other communities that are similar to us, because I think in those ways, uh, we're not necessarily unique. And, uh, but maybe we find our spin on it. I don't know. Thanks. Um, so I've seen your latest campaign literature. There's four people on it. So you are apparently running as part of a team uh, that's not unheard of in local politics, but it's not super common either. Can you tell us about, or about why you're doing that? And can you tell us a little bit about uh, the other people on the team, because not all of them will be as well known to the public as you are. Yeah, I think no matter what party uh, affiliation you have in municipal elections or nonpartisan, um, or how you may feel about certain issues, something is happening in Waltham, and you and 781 News are kind of at the top of the pyramid of it involve, an increased involvement in civic engagement. And it's super awesome. It is exactly what we need. This is exactly the time for it, especially uh, looking at Jonathan Paz, Councillor Paz stepping in, wanting to run for mayor, has taken that level of community engagement to yet another level because he has always been the Ward 9 counselor, but when I'm talking to people in Ward 1 and Ward 3 in North Waltham, they already know who he is because he has a strong newsletter. He's held community forums. You know, he and I have done a couple of community forums. We did one on Moody Street. We did a listening session about the farm and an education session about the farm at 240 Beaver Street. So it's really exciting to see that he has taken this community engagement to another level and and bringing in folks like Emily Sapiria and Emma Zumas, the two women that I am supporting that are running at large, both have a public health background, nutrition education background, and they have this perspective about uh, cities through that lens. And that touches upon everything housing, climate, transportation, you know, the health of overall health of our, our residents and our city. And I just think they would bring that perspective to everything we talk about at City Hall. On top of the fact that they're just so engaged in our community. And we have to celebrate that, right? Because we see the voter turnout percentages every year. <laughs> and they're not pretty. 
They're not pretty. People feel pretty darn removed from what's happening in their own community. And that's why I decided to help people run seven years ago. That's why I decided to run because I couldn't sit back anymore and, and watch what was happening. I needed to be a part of that. And I see Emma Zumas and Emily Superior taking that next step to say, I want to be involved. Even at the ward level, we have a bunch of candidates that are also doing that and saying, hey, I've lived here for, you know, a few years uh, or I've lived here for a decade, however long it is. I, I know there's a, a sentiment out there that you have to be born and raised here. And I, I, I don't agree with that. I don't know if I would be qualified to go back to my hometown of Beverly and and run things just because I was born there and I grew up there. I think that these folks saying, I want to step up and be a part of my community is huge because there's a lot of people who have a lot of opinions <laughs> who are not stepping up. Uh, and so I'm really excited about Emma um, and Emily. I would love to have them as colleagues because I think that their perspective as, you know, public health slash nutrition. They're just super smart. And like, I really <laughs> want that kind of lens because I don't have that kind of lens. And I think that um, it's a really holistic way of, of looking at our city. You know, Emily has been involved with farming, community farming. I mean, we have four community farms in Waltham. We need a perspective like hers and, you know, Emma's uh, children go to the dual language school. That is a potentially future sort of education model. And we, we've seen the benefits of it early on. And there's no doubt in my mind that, you know, we have uh, some data points to say this bilingual education model is working uh, for everybody. That's great. So uh, so that's Emma Zumas and Emily Superior are on the ballot with you for at large in the prelim September 12th and also mayor on the ballot and also Ward 3 on the ballot in that prelim. And then the people who survive that will go on to the full election in November. Um, thank you very much, Councillor Colleen Bradley MacArthur, for being here. Thank you so much. And thank you for for all you do to educate everybody in this community. I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot.